Disc 3 The Blue Geranium When I was down here last year, said Sir Henry Clithering, and stopped. His hostess, Mrs. Bantry, looked at him curiously. The ex-commissioner of Scotland Yard was staying with old friends of his, Colonel and Mrs. Bantry, who lived near St. Mary Mead. Mrs. Bantry, pen in hand, had just asked his advice as to who should be invited to make a sixth guest at a dinner that evening. Yes, said Mrs. Bantry encouragingly, when you were here last year. Tell me, said Sir Henry, do you know a Miss Marple? Mrs. Bantry was surprised, the last thing she had expected. No, Miss Marple, who doesn't? A typical old maid of fiction. Quite a dear, but hopelessly behind the times. Do you mean you'd like me to ask her to dinner? You're surprised? A little, I must confess. I should hardly have thought you, but, uh, oh, perhaps there's an explanation. The explanation's simple enough. When I was down here last year, we got into the habit of discussing unsolved mysteries. There were five or six of us. Raymond West, the novelist, started it. We each supplied a story to which we knew the answer, but nobody else did. Supposed to be an exercise in the deductive faculties to see who could get nearest the truth. Well, like in the old story, we hardly realized that Miss Marple was playing, but we were very polite about it. Didn't want to hurt the old dear's feelings. And now comes the cream of the jest. The old lady outdid us every time. What? I assure you, straight to the truth like a homing pigeon. But how extraordinary! My dear old Miss Marple has hardly ever been out of St. Mary Mead. Ah, but according to her, that has given her unlimited opportunities of observing human nature, under the microscope, as it were. I suppose there's something in that, conceded Mrs. Bantry. One would at least know the petty side of people. But I don't think we have any really exciting criminals in our midst. I, I think we must try her with Arthur's ghost story after dinner. I'd be thankful if she found a solution to that. I didn't know that Arthur believed in ghosts. Oh, he doesn't. That's what worries him so. It happened to a friend of his, George Pritchard. Most prosaic person. It's really rather tragic for poor George. Either this extraordinary story is true, or else... Or else what? Mrs. Bantry did not answer. After a minute or two, she said irrelevantly, You know, I like George. Everyone does. One can't believe that he... Well, but people do such extraordinary things. Sir Henry nodded. He knew better than Mrs. Bantry the extraordinary things that people did. So it came about that evening... Mrs. Bantry looked round her dinner table, shivering a little as she did so, because the dining room, like most English dining rooms, was extremely cold, and fixed her gaze on the very upright old lady sitting on her husband's right. Miss Marple wore black lace mittens, an old lace fichu was draped round her shoulders, and another piece of lace surmounted her white hair. She was talking animatedly to the elderly doctor, Dr. Lloyd, about the workhouse and the suspected shortcomings of the district nurse. Mrs. Bantry marveled anew. She even wondered whether Sir Henry had been making an elaborate joke, but there seemed no point in that. Incredible that what he had said could be really true. Her glance went on and rested affectionately on her red-faced, broad-shouldered husband as he sat talking horses to Jane Hellyer, the beautiful and popular actress. Jane, more beautiful, if that were possible, off the stage than on, opened her enormous blue eyes and murmured at discreet intervals, Really? Oh, fancy! How extraordinary! She knew nothing whatever about horses and cared less. Arthur, said Mrs. Bantry, you're boring poor Jane to distraction. Leave horses alone and tell her your ghost story instead. You know, George Pritchard. Eh, hey, Dolly? Oh, but I don't know. Sir Henry wants to hear it too. I was telling him something about it this morning. It'll be interesting to hear what everyone has to say about it. Oh, do, said Jane. I love ghost stories. Well, Colonel Bantry hesitated, 
I've never believed much in the supernatural, but this... I, I don't think any of you know George Pritchard. He's one of the best. His wife... Well, she's dead now, poor woman. I'll just say this much. She didn't give George any too easy a time when she was alive. She was one of those semi-invalids. I believe she really had something wrong with her, but whatever it was, she played it for all it was worth. She was capricious, exacting, unreasonable. She complained from morning to night. George was expected to wait on her hand and foot, and everything he did was always wrong, and he got cursed for it. Most men, I'm fully convinced, would have hit her over the head with a hatchet long ago. Eh, Dolly, isn't that so? She was a dreadful woman, said Mrs. Bantry with conviction. If George Pritchard had brained her with a hatchet, and there'd been any woman on the jury, he would have been triumphantly acquitted. I don't quite know how this business started. George was rather vague about it. I gather Mrs. Pritchard had always had a weakness for fortune-tellers, palmists, clairvoyants, anything of that sort. George didn't mind. She found amusement in it well and good. But he refused to go into rhapsodies himself, and that was another grievance. A succession of hospital nurses was always passing through the house, Mrs. Pritchard usually becoming dissatisfied with them after a few weeks. One young nurse had been very keen on this fortune-telling stunt, and for a time Mrs. Pritchard had been very fond of her. Then she suddenly fell out with her and insisted on her going. She had back another nurse who had been with her previously, an older woman, experienced and tactful in dealing with a neurotic patient. Nurse Copling, according to George, was a very good sort, a sensible woman to talk to. She put up with Mrs. Pritchard's tantrums and nerve storms as complete indifference. Mrs. Pritchard always lunched upstairs, and it was usual at lunchtime for George and the nurse to come to some arrangement for the afternoon. Strictly speaking, the nurse went off from two to four, but to oblige, as the phrase goes, she would sometimes take her time off after tea if George wanted to be free for the afternoon. On this occasion, she mentioned that she was going to see her sister at Golders Green and might be a little late returning. George's face fell, for he had arranged to play a round of golf. Nurse Copling, however, reassured him. We'll neither of us be missed, Mr. Pritchard. A twinkle came into her eye. Mrs. Pritchard's going to have more exciting company than ours. Who's that? Wait a minute. Nurse Copling's eyes twinkled more than ever. Now let me get it right. Zareeda, psychic reader of the future. Oh, Lord, groaned George. It's a new one, isn't it? Quite new. I believe my predecessor, Nurse Carstairs, sent her along. Mrs. Pritchard hasn't seen her yet. She made me write, fixing an appointment for this afternoon. Well, at any rate, I shall get my golf, said George, and he went off with the kindliest feelings towards Zareeda, the reader of the future. On his return to the house, he found Mrs. Pritchard in a state of great agitation. She was, as usual, lying on her invalid couch, and she had a bottle of smelling salts in her hand, which she sniffed at frequent intervals. George, she exclaimed, what did I tell you about this house? The moment I came into it, I felt there was something wrong. Didn't I tell you so at the time? Repressing his desire to reply, you always do, George said, no, can't say I remember it. You never do remember anything that has to do with me. Men are all extraordinarily callous. But I really believe that you are more insensitive than most. Oh, come now, Mary, dear, that's not fair. Well, as I was telling you, this woman knew at once. She, she actually blanched, if you know what I mean. She came in at that door and she said, There is evil here, evil in danger, I feel it. Very unwisely, George laughed. Well, you've had your money's worth this afternoon. His wife closed her eyes and took a long sniff from her smelling bottle. How you hate me! You would jeer and laugh if I were dying. George protested, and after a minute or two she went on. You may laugh, but I tell you the whole thing. This house is definitely dangerous to me. The woman said so. George's formerly kind feelings towards Zarida underwent a change. He knew his wife was perfectly capable of insisting on moving to a new house if the caprice got hold of her. 
What else did she say? He asked. Well, she couldn't tell me very much. She, she was so upset. One thing she did say: I had some violets in a glass. She pointed at them and cried out, "Take those away! No blue flowers! Never have blue flowers! Blue flowers are fatal to you. Remember that." And you know," added Mrs. Pritchard, "I always have told you that blue as a colour is repellent to me. I feel a natural, instinctive sort of warning against it." George was much too wise to remark that he had never heard her say so before. Instead, he asked what the mysterious Zarida was like. Mrs. Pritchard entered with gusto upon a description: a、oh, black-haired, in coiled knobs over her ears; her eyes were half closed; great black rims round them; she had a black veil over her mouth and chin; she spoke in a kind of singing voice with a marked foreign accent, Spanish, I think. In fact, all the usual stock in trade," said George cheerfully. His wife immediately closed her eyes. "I feel extremely ill," she said. "Ring for nurse. Unkindness upsets me, and you know it only too well." It was two days later that Nurse Copling came to George with a grave face. "Will you come to Mrs. Pritchard, please? She's had a letter which upsets her greatly." He found his wife with a letter in her hand. She held it out to him. Read it," she said. George read it. It was on heavily scented paper, and the writing was big and black. I have seen the future. Be warned before it is too late. Beware of the full moon. The blue primrose means warning. The blue hollyhock means danger. The blue geranium means death. Just about to burst out laughing. George caught Nurse Copling's eye. She made a quick warning gesture. He said rather awkwardly, "The woman's probably trying to frighten you, Mary. Anyway, there aren't such things as blue primroses and blue geraniums." But Mrs. Pritchard began to cry and say her days were numbered. Nurse Copling came out with George upon the landing. Of all the silly tomfoolery, he burst out, "I suppose it is." Something in the nurse's tone struck him, and he stared at her in amazement. Surely, nurse, you don't believe? No, no, Mister Pritchard, I don't believe in reading the future. That's nonsense. What puzzles me is the meaning of this. Fortune tellers are usually out for what they can get, but this woman seems to be frightening Missus Pritchard with no advantage to herself. I can't see the point. There's another thing. Yes. Mrs. Pritchard says that something about the reader was faintly familiar to her. Well, well, I don't like it, Mr. Pritchard. That's all. I didn't know you were so superstitious, Nurse. I'm not superstitious, but I know when a thing is fishy. It was about four days after this that the first incident happened. To explain it to you, I shall have to describe Mrs. Pritchard's room. You better let me do that," interrupted Mrs. Bantry. "It it was prepared with one of these new wallpapers, where you apply clumps of flowers to make a kind of herbaceous border. The effect is almost like being in a garden, though of course the flowers are all wrong. I mean, they simply couldn't be in bloom all at the same time. Don't let a passion for horticultural accuracy run away with you, Dolly," said her husband. "We all know you're an enthusiastic gardener." Well, it is absurd," protested Mrs. Bantry, "to have bluebells and daffodils and lupins and hollyhocks and Michaelmas daisies all grouped together." Most unscientific," said Sir Henry. "But to proceed with the story. Well, amongst these massed flowers were primroses, clumps of yellow and pink primroses, and、uh, oh, go on, Arthur. This is your story." Colonel Bantry took up the tale. Mrs. Pritchard rang her bell violently one morning. The household came running. Thought she was an extremist. Not at all. She was violently excited and pointing at the wallpaper. And sure enough, was one blue primrose in the midst of the others. Oh," said Miss Helia, "how creepy!" The question was: Hadn't the blue primrose always been there? That was George's suggestion and the nurse's. But Mrs. Pritchard wouldn't have it at any price. She had never noticed it till that very morning, and the night before it had been full moon. She was very upset about it.
I met George Pritchard that same day, and he told me about it, said Mrs. Bantry. I went to see Mrs. Pritchard and did my best to ridicule the whole thing, but without success. I came away really concerned, and I remember I met Jean Instow and told her about it. Jean's a queer girl, she said, so she's really upset about it. I told her that I thought the woman was perfectly capable of dying of fright. She was really abnormally superstitious. I remember Jean rather startled me with what she said next. She said, Well, that might be all for the best, mightn't it? And she said it so coolly, in so matter-of-fact a tone, that I was really, well, shocked. Of course, I know it's done nowadays to be brutal and outspoken, but I never get used to it. Jean smiled at me rather oddly and said, You don't like my saying that, but it's true. What use is Mrs. Pritchard's life to her? None at all. And it's hell for George Pritchard. Have his wife frightened out of existence would be the best thing that could happen to him. I said, George is most awfully good to her always. And she said, Yes, he deserves a reward, poor dear. He's a very attractive person, George Pritchard. The last nurse thought so, the pretty one. What was her name? Carstairs. That was the cause of the row between her and Mrs. P. Now, I didn't like hearing Jean say that. Of course, one had wondered. Mrs. Bantry paused significantly. Yes, dear, said Miss Marple placidly. One always does. Is Miss Insto a pretty girl? I suppose she plays golf. Yes, she's good at games, and she's nice-looking, attractive-looking, very fair, with healthy skin and nice, steady blue eyes. Of course, we've always felt that she and George Pritchard, I mean, if things have been different, they are so well suited to one another. And they were friends, asked Miss Marple. Oh, yes, great friends. Do you think, Dolly, said Colonel Bantry plaintively, that I might be allowed to go on with my story? Arthur, said Mrs. Bantry resignedly, wants to get back to his ghosts. I had the rest of the story from George himself, went on the colonel. There's no doubt that Mrs. Pritchard got the wind up badly towards the end of the next month. She marked off on a calendar the day when the moon would be full, and on that night she had both the nurse and then George into her room and made them study the wallpaper carefully. There were pink hollyhocks and red ones, but there were no blue amongst them. Then, when George left the room, she locked the door. And in the morning, there was a large blue high hawk, said Miss Hellier joyfully. Quite right, said Colonel Bantry, or at any rate, nearly right. One flower of a hollyhock just above her head had turned blue. It staggered George, and of course the more it staggered him, the more he refused to take the thing seriously. He insisted that the whole thing was some kind of practical joke. He ignored the evidence of the locked door and the fact that Mrs. Pritchard discovered the change before anyone, even Nurse Copling, was admitted. It staggered George, and it made him unreasonable. His wife wanted to leave the house, and he wouldn't let her. He was inclined to believe in the supernatural for the first time, but he wasn't going to admit it. He usually gave in to his wife, but this time he wouldn't. Mary was not to make a fool of herself, he said. The whole thing was the most infernal nonsense. And so the next month sped away. Mrs. Pritchard made less protest than one would have imagined. I think she was superstitious enough to believe that she couldn't escape her fate. She repeated again and again, The blue primrose, warning. The blue hollyhock, danger. The blue geranium, death. And she would lie looking at the clump of pinky-red geraniums nearest her bed. The whole business was pretty nervy. Even the nurse caught the infection. She came to George two days before full moon and begged him to take Mrs. Pritchard away. George was angry. If all the flowers on that damned wall turned into blue devils, it couldn't kill anyone, he shouted. It might. Shock has killed people before now. Nonsense, said George. George has always been a shade pig-headed. You can't drive him. I believe he had a secret idea that his wife worked the changes herself, and that it was all some morbid, hysterical plan of hers. Well, the fatal night came. Mrs. Pritchard locked her door as usual. She was very calm, in almost an exalted state of mind. 
The nurse was worried by her state. I wanted to give her a stimulant, an injection of strychnine, but Mrs. Pritchard refused. In a way, I believe she was enjoying herself. George said she was. I think that's quite possible, said Mrs. Bantry. There must have been a strange sort of glamour about the whole thing. There was no violent ringing of a bell the next morning. Mrs. Pritchard usually woke about eight. When at 8.30 there was no sign from her, Nurse rapped loudly on the door. Getting no reply, she fetched George and insisted on the door being broken open. They did so with the help of a chisel. One look at the still figure on the bed was enough for Nurse Copling. She sent George to telephone for the doctor, but it was too late. Mrs. Pritchard, he said, must have been dead at least eight hours. Her smelling salts lay by her hand on the bed, and on the wall beside her, one of the pinky-red geraniums was a bright, deep blue. Horrible, said Miss Helia with a shiver. Sir Henry was frowning. No additional details. Colonel Bantry shook his head, but Mrs. Bantry spoke quickly. The gas. What about the gas, asked Sir Henry. When the doctor arrived, there was a slight smell of gas, and sure enough, he found the gas ring in the fireplace very slightly turned on, but so little that it couldn't have mattered. Did Mr. Pritchard and the nurse not notice it when they first went in? The nurse said she did notice a slight smell. George said he didn't notice gas, but something made him feel very queer and overcome. But he put that down to shock, and probably it was. At any rate, there was no question of gas poisoning. The smell was scarcely noticeable. And that's the end of the story. No, it isn't. One way and another, there was a lot of talk. The servants, you see, had overheard things. Had heard, for instance, Mrs. Pritchard telling her husband that he hated her and would jeer if she were dying. And also more recent remarks. She said one day, apropos of his refusing to leave the house, very well, when I am dead, I hope everyone will realize that you have killed me. And as ill luck would have it, he had been mixing some weed killer for the garden paths the very day before. One of the younger servants had seen him, and had afterwards seen him taking up a glass of hot milk to his wife. The talk spread and grew. The doctor had given a certificate, I don't know exactly in what terms, shock, syncope, heart failure, probably some medical term meaning nothing much. However, the poor lady had not been a month in her grave before an exhumation order was applied for and granted. And the result of the autopsy was nil, I remember, said Sir Henry gravely. A case for once of smoke without fire. The whole thing is really very curious, said Mrs. Bantry. That fortune teller, for instance, Zarida. The address where she was supposed to be, no one had ever heard of any such person. She appeared once out of the blue, said her husband, and then utterly vanished. Out of the blue? Oh, that's rather good. And what is more, continued Mrs. Bantry, little nurse Carstairs, who was supposed to have recommended her, had never even heard of her. They looked at each other. It's a mysterious story, said Dr. Lloyd. One can make guesses, but to guess... Oh, he shook his head. Has Mr. Pritchard married, Miss Instow? asked Miss Marple in her gentle voice. Now, why do you ask that, inquired Sir Henry. Miss Marple opened gentle blue eyes. It seems to me so important, she said. Have they married? Colonel Bantry shook his head. We, uh, well, we expected something of the kind, but it's eighteen months now. I don't believe they even see much of each other. That is important, said Miss Marple, very important. Then you think the same as I do, said Mrs. Bantry. You think, now, Dolly, said her husband, it is unjustifiable what you're going to say. You can't go about accusing people without a shadow of proof. Oh, don't be so, so manly, Arthur. Men are always afraid to say anything. Anyway, this is all between ourselves. It's just a wild, fantastic idea of mine that possibly... Only possibly Jean Instow disguised herself as a fortune teller. Mind you, she might have done it for a joke. 
I don't for a minute think that she meant any harm, but if she did do it, and if Mrs. Pritchard was foolish enough to die of fright. Well, that's what Miss Marple meant, wasn't it? No, dear, not quite, said Miss Marple. You see, if I were going to kill anyone, which of course I wouldn't dream of doing for a minute because it would be very wicked, and besides I don't like killing, not even wasps, although I know it has to be, and I, I'm sure the gardener does it as humanely as possible. Uh, now let me see, what was I saying? If you wish to kill anyone, prompted Sir Henry. Oh, yes, well, if I did, I shouldn't be at all satisfied to trust to fright. I know one reads of people dying of it, but it seems a very uncertain sort of thing, and the most nervous people are far more brave than one really thinks they are. I should like something definite and certain and make a thoroughly good plan about it. Miss Marple, said Sir Henry, you frighten me. I hope you'll never wish to remove me. Your plans would be too good. Miss Marple looked at him reproachfully. I thought I'd made it clear that I would never contemplate such wickedness, she said. No, I was trying to put myself in the place of a, a certain person. Do you mean George Pritchard? asked Colonel Bantry. I'll never believe it of George, though, mind you, even the nurse believes it. I went and saw her about a month afterwards at the time of the exhumation. She didn't know how it was done. In fact, she wouldn't say anything at all, but it was clear enough that she believed George to be in some way responsible for his wife's death. She was convinced of it. Well, said Dr. Lloyd, perhaps she wasn't so far wrong, and mind you, a nurse often knows. She can't say, she's got no proof, but she knows. Sir Henry leant forward. Come now, Miss Marple, he said persuasively, you're lost in a daydream. Won't you tell us all about it? Miss Marple started and turned pink. Oh, I beg your pardon, she said. I, w I was just thinking about our district nurse. This difficult problem. More difficult than the problem of a blue geranium? It really depends on the primroses, said Miss Marple. I mean, Mrs. Bantry said they were yellow and pink. If it was a pink primrose that turned blue, of course that fits in perfectly. But if it happened to be a yellow one... It was a pink one, said Mrs. Bantry. She stared. They all stared at Miss Marple. Then that seems to settle it, said Miss Marple. She shook her head regretfully, and the wasp season and everything, and, of course, the gas. It reminds you, I suppose, of countless village tragedies, said Sir Henry. Not tragedies, said Miss Marple, and certainly nothing criminal, but it does remind me a little of the trouble we are having with the district nurse. After all, nurses are human beings, and what with having to be so correct in their behaviour and wearing those uncomfortable collars and being so thrown with the family, well, can you wonder that things sometimes happen? A glimmer of light broke upon Sir Henry. You mean Nurse Carstairs. Oh, no, no, not Nurse Carstairs, Nurse Copling. You see, she'd been there before and was very much thrown with Mr. Pritchard, who you say is an attractive man. I dare say she thought, poor thing, well, well, we needn't go into that. I don't suppose she knew about Miss Instow. And, of course, afterwards, when she found out, it turned her against him, and she tried to do all the harm she could. Of course, the letter really gave her away, didn't it? What letter? Well, she wrote to the fortune teller at Mrs. Pritchard's request, and the fortune teller came apparently in answer to the letter, but later it was discovered that there never had been such a person at that address. So that shows that Nurse Copling was in it. She only pretended to write. So what could be more likely than she was the fortune teller herself? I never saw the point about the letter, said Sir Henry. That's the most important point, of course. Rather a bold step to take, said Miss Marple, because Mrs. Pritchard might have recognised her in spite of the disguise, though, of course, if she had, the nurse could have pretended it was a joke. What did you mean, said Sir Henry, when you said that if you were a certain person, you would not have trusted to fright? Oh, one couldn't be sure that way, said Miss Marple. No, I think that the warnings and the blue flowers were, if I may use a military term, <laughs> she laughed self-consciously, just, just camouflage. And the real thing? I know, said Miss Marple apologetically, that I've got wasps on the brain. Poor things, destroyed in their thousands. 
and usually on such a beautiful summer's day, but I remember thinking, when I saw the gardener shaking up the cyanide of potassium in a bottle with water, how like smelling salts it looked. And if it were put in a smelling salt bottle and substituted for the real one, well, the poor lady was in the habit of using her smelling salt. Indeed, you said they were found by her hand. Then, of course, while Mr. Pritchard went to telephone to the doctor, the nurse would change it for the real bottle, and she'd just turn on the gas a little to mask any smell of almonds, and in case anyone felt queer. And I always have heard the cyanide leaves no trace if you wait long enough. Of course, I, I may be wrong, and it may have been something entirely different in the bottle, but that doesn't really matter, does it? Miss Marple paused, a little out of breath. Jane Hellier leaned forward and said, but the blue geranium and the other flowers. Nurses always have litmus paper, don't they, said Miss Marple, for, uh, well, for testing. Not a very pleasant subject. We won't dwell on it. I, I, I've done a little nursing myself. She grew delicately pink. Blue turns red with acids, and red turns blue with alkalis. So easy to paste some red litmus over a red flower near the bed, of course. And then, when the poor lady used her smelling salts, the strong ammonia fumes would turn it blue. Really, most ingenious. Of course, the geranium wasn't blue when they first broke into the room. Nobody noticed it till afterwards. When Nurse changed the bottle, she held the sal ammoniac against the wallpaper for a minute, I expect. You might have been there, Miss Marple, said Sir Henry. What worries me, said Miss Marple, is poor Mr. Pritchard and that nice girl, Miss Instow, probably both suspecting each other and keeping apart, and life so very short. She shook her head. You needn't worry, said Sir Henry. As a matter of fact, I have something up my sleeve. A nurse has been arrested on a charge of murdering an elderly patient who had left her a legacy. It was done with cyanide of potassium substituted for smelling salts. Nurse Copling trying the same trick again. Miss Instow and Mr. Pritchard need have no doubts as to the truth. Now, isn't that nice, cried Miss Marple. I don't mean about the new murder, of course. That very sad and shows how much wickedness there is in the world and that if once you give way... Oh, which reminds me, I must finish my little conversation with you, Dr. Lloyd, about the village nurse. The Four Suspects The Four Suspects The conversation hovered round undiscovered and unpunished crimes. Everyone in turn vouchsafed their opinion. Colonel Bantry, his plump, amiable wife, Jane Hellyer, Dr. Lloyd, and even old Miss Marple. The one person who did not speak was the one best fitted, in most people's opinion, to do so. Sir Henry Clithering, ex-commissioner of Scotland Yard, sat silent, twisting his moustache, or rather stroking it and half smiling, as though at some inward thought that amused him. Sir Henry, said Mrs. Bantry at last, if you don't say something, I shall scream. Are there a lot of crimes that go unpunished, or are there not? You're thinking of newspaper headlines, Mrs. Bantry, Scotland Yard at fault again, and a list of unsolved mysteries to follow, which really, I suppose, form a very small percentage of the whole, said Dr. Lloyd. Yes, that is so. The hundreds of crimes that are solved and the perpetrators punished are seldom held in sung. But that isn't quite the point at issue, is it? When you talk of undiscovered crimes and unsolved crimes, you're talking of two different things. In the first category come all the crimes that Scotland Yard never hears about, the crimes that no one even knows have been committed. But I suppose there aren't very many of those, said Mrs. Bantry. Aren't there? Say, Henry, you don't mean there are. I should think, said Miss Marple thoughtfully, that there must be a very large number. The charming old lady with her old world unruffled air made her statement in a tone of the utmost placidity.
My dear Miss Marple, said Colonel Bantry. Of course, said Miss Marple, a lot of people are stupid, and stupid people get found out, whatever they do. But there are quite a number of people who aren't stupid, and one shudders to think of what they might accomplish unless they had very strongly rooted principles. Yes, said Sir Henry, there are a lot of people who aren't stupid. How often does some crime come to light simply by reason of a bit of unmitigated bungling, and each time one asks oneself the question, if this hadn't been bungled, would anybody ever have known? But that's very serious, Clithering, said Colonel Bantry, very serious indeed. Is it? What do you mean, is it? Of course it's serious. You say crime goes unpunished, but does it? Unpunished by the law, perhaps, but cause and effect work outside the law. To say that every crime brings its own punishment is by way of being a platitude, and yet, in my opinion, nothing can be truer. Perhaps, perhaps, said Colonel Bantry, but that doesn't alter the seriousness, the, uh, the, the, the seriousness. He paused, rather at a loss. Sir Henry Tithering smiled. Ninety-nine people out of a hundred are doubtless of your way of thinking, he said, but you know, it isn't really guilt that's important. It's innocence. That's the thing that nobody will realise. I don't understand, said Jane Hillier. I do, said Miss Marple. When Mrs. Trent found half a crown missing from her bag, the person it affected most was the daily woman, Mrs. Arthur. Of course the Trents thought it was her, but being kindly people, and knowing that she had a large family and a husband who drinks, well, they naturally didn't want to go to extremes, but they felt differently towards her, and they didn't leave her in charge of the house when they went away, which made a great difference to her, and other people began to get a feeling about her too. And then it suddenly came out that it was the governess. Mrs. Trent saw her through a door reflected in a mirror. The purest chance though I prefer to call it providence. And that, I think, is what Sir Henry means. Most people would be only interested in who took the money, and it turned out to be the most unlikely person, just like in detective stories. But the real person it was life and death to was poor Mrs. Arthur, who had done nothing. That's what you mean, isn't it, Sir Henry? Yes, Miss Marple, you fit off my meaning exactly. Your charwoman person was lucky in the instance you relate. Her innocence was shown, but some people may go through a lifetime crushed by the weight of a suspicion that is really unjustified. Are you thinking of some particular instance, Sir Henry? asked Mrs. Bantry shrewdly. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Bantry, I am. A very curious case. A case where we believe murder to have been committed, but with no possible chance of ever proving it. Poison, I suppose, breathed Jane, something untraceable. Dr. Lloyd moved restlessly, and Sir Henry shook his head. No, dear lady, not the secret arrow poison of the South American Indians. I wish it were something of that kind. We have to deal with something much more prosaic, so prosaic, in fact, that there is no hope of bringing the deed home to its perpetrator. An old gentleman who fell downstairs and broke his neck one of those regrettable accidents which happen every day. But what happened, really? Who can say? Sir Henry shrugged his shoulders. A push from behind? A piece of cotton or string tied across the top of the stairs and carefully removed afterwards? That we shall never know. But you do think that it, uh, well, wasn't an accident? Now why? asked the doctor. That's rather a long story, but... Uh, well, yes, we're pretty sure. As I said, there's no chance of being able to bring the deed home to anyone. The evidence would be too flimsy. But there's the other aspect of the case, the one I was speaking about. You see, there were four people who might have done the trick. One's guilty, but the other three are innocent. And unless the truth is found out, those three are going to remain under the terrible shadow of doubt. I think, said Mrs. Bantry, that you'd better tell us your long story. Well, I needn't make it so very long, after all, said Sir Henry. I can at any rate condense the beginning. That deals with the German secret society. The Schwarzhand, something after the lines of the Camorra, or what is most people's idea of the Camorra. 
a scheme of blackmail and terrorization. The thing started quite suddenly after the war and spread to an amazing extent. Numberless people were victimized by it. The authorities were not successful in coping with it, for its secrets were jealously guarded, and it was almost impossible to find anyone who could be induced to betray them. Nothing much was ever known about it in England, but in Germany it was having a most paralyzing effect. It was finally broken up and dispersed through the efforts of one man, a Dr. Rosen, who had at one time been very prominent in secret service work. He became a member, penetrated its inmost circle, and was, as I say, instrumental in bringing about its downfall. But he was, in consequence, a marked man, and it was deemed wise that he should leave Germany, at any rate for a time. He came to England, and we had letters about him from the police in Berlin. He came and had a personal interview with me. His point of view was both dispassionate and resigned. He had no doubts of what the future held for him. They'll get me, Sir Henry, he said, not a doubt of it. He was a big man with a fine head and a very deep voice, with only a slight guttural intonation to tell of his nationality. That is a foregone conclusion. Does not matter. I am prepared. I faced the risk when I undertook this business. I have done what I set out to do. The organization can never be gotten together again, but there are members of it at liberty, and they will take the only revenge they can. My life. It is simply a question of time, but I am anxious that that time should be as long as possible. You see, I am collecting and editing some very interesting material, the result of my life's work. I should like, if possible, to be able to complete my task. He spoke very simply with a certain grandeur which I could not but admire. I told him we would take all precautions, but he waved my words aside. Some day, sooner or later, they will get me, he repeated. When that day comes, do not distress yourself. You will, I have no doubt, have done all that is possible. He then proceeded to outline his plans, which were simple enough. He proposed to take a small cottage in the country where he could live quietly and go on with his work. In the end, he selected a village in Somerset, King's Nathan, which was seven miles from a railway station and singularly untouched by civilization. He bought a very charming cottage, had various improvements and alterations made, and settled down there most contentedly. His household consisted of his niece Greta, a secretary, an old German servant who had served him faithfully for nearly forty years, and an outside handyman and gardener who was a native of King's Nathan. The four suspects, said Dr. Lloyd softly. Exactly, the four suspects. There's not much more to tell. Life went on peacefully at King's Nathan for five months, and then the blow fell. Dr. Rosen fell down the stairs one morning and was found dead about half an hour later. At the time the accident must have taken place, Gertrude was in her kitchen with the door closed and heard nothing, so she says. Fräulein Greta was in the garden planting some bulbs. Again, so she says. The gardener Dobbs was in the small potting shed having his elevenders, so he says, and the secretary was out for a walk, and once more there is only his word for it. No one had an alibi. No one can corroborate anyone else's story, but one thing is certain. No one from outside could have done it, for a stranger in the little village of King's Nathan would be noticed without fail. Both the back and the front doors were locked, each member of the household having their own key. So you see, it narrows down to those four, and yet each one seems to be above suspicion. Greta, his own brother's child, Gertrude, with forty years of faithful service, Dobbs, who had never been out of King's Nathan, and Charles Templeton, the secretary. Yes, said Colonel Bantry, what about him? He seems a suspicious person to my mind. What do you know about him? It is what I knew about him that put him completely out of court. At any rate, at the time, said Sir Henry gravely, you see, Charles Templeton was one of my own men. Oh, said Colonel Bantry, considerably taken aback. 
Yes, I wanted to have someone on the spot, and at the same time I didn't want to cause talk in the village. Rosen really needed a secretary. I put Templeton on the job. He's a gentleman, he speaks German fluently, and he's altogether a very able fellow. But then, which do you suspect? asked Mrs. Bantry in a bewildered tone. They all seem so, well, impossible. Yes, so it appears. But you can look at the thing from another angle. Fräulein Greta was his niece and a very lovely girl, but the war has shown us time and again that brother can turn against sister or father against son and so on, and the loveliest and gentlest of young girls did some of the most amazing things. The same applies to Gertrude, and who knows what other forces might be at work in her case. A quarrel, perhaps, with her master, a growing resentment all the more lasting because of the long faithful years behind her. Elderly women of that class can be amazingly bitter sometimes. And Dobbs, was he right outside it because he had no connection with the family? Money will do much. In some ways, Dobbs might have been approached and bought. For one thing seems certain. Some message or some order must have come from outside. Otherwise, why five months' immunity? No, the agents of the society must have been at work. Not yet sure of Rosen's perfidy, they delayed till the betrayal had been traced to him beyond any possible doubt. And then, all doubt set aside, they must have sent their message to the spy within the gates, the message that said, Kill. How nasty, said Jane Hillier, and shuddered. But how did the message come? That was the point I tried to elucidate. The one hope of solving my problem. One of those four people must have been approached or communicated with in some way. There would be no delay. I knew that as soon as the command came, it would be carried out. That was a peculiarity of the Schwarzhand. I went into the question, went into it in a way that will probably strike you as being ridiculously meticulous. Who had come to the cottage that morning? I eliminated nobody. Here's the list. He took an envelope from his pocket and selected a paper from its contents. The butcher, bringing some neck of mutton, investigated and found correct. The grocer's assistant, bringing a packet of corn flour, two pounds of sugar, a pound of butter, and a pound of coffee, also investigated and found correct. The postman, bringing two circulars for Fräulein Rosen, a local letter for Gertrude, Three letters for Dr. Rosen, one with a foreign stamp, and two letters for Mr. Templeton, one also with a foreign stamp. Sir Henry paused and then took a sheaf of documents from the envelope. It may interest you to see these for yourself. They were handed me by the various people concerned or collected from the waste paper basket. I need hardly say they've been tested by experts for invisible ink, etc. No excitement of that kind is possible. Everyone crowded round to look. The catalogues were respectively from a nurseryman and from a prominent London fur establishment. The two bills addressed to Dr. Rosen were a local one for seeds for the garden and one from a London stationery firm. The latter addressed to him ran as follows. My dear Rosen, just back from Dr. Helmut's Spatz. I saw Edgar Jackson the other day. He and Amos Perry have just come back from Sing Tao. In all honesty, I can't say I envy them the trip. Let me have news of you soon. As I said before, beware of a certain person. You know who I mean, though you don't agree. Yours, Georgina. Mr. Templeton's mail consisted of this bill, which, as you see, is an account rendered from his tailor, and a letter from a friend in Germany, went on Sir Henry. The latter, unfortunately, he tore up whilst out on his walk. Finally, we have the letter received by Gertrude. Dear Mrs. Schwartz, we are hoping as how you'll be able to come to the social on Friday evening. The vicar says as he hopes you will, one and all being welcome. The recipe for the ham was very good, and I thank you for it. Hoping as this finds you well, and that we shall see you Friday, I remain, yours faithfully, Emma Green. Dr. Lloyd smiled a little over this and said to Mrs. Bantry, I think the last letter can be put out of court, said Dr. Lloyd. 
I thought the same, said Sir Henry, but I took the precaution of verifying that there was a Mrs. Green at the church social. One can't be too careful, you know. That's what our friend Miss Marple always says, said Dr. Lloyd, smiling. You're lost in a daydream, Miss Marple. What are you thinking out? Miss Marple gave a start. Oh, so stupid of me, she said. I was just wondering why the word honesty in Dr. Rosen's letter was spelt with a capital H. Mrs. Bantry picked it up. So it is, she said. Oh. Yes, dear, said Miss Marple. I thought you'd notice. There's a definite warning in that letter, said Colonel Bantry. That's the first thing that caught my attention. I notice more than you think. Yes, a definite warning. Against whom? There is rather a curious point about that letter, says Sir Henry. According to Templeton, Dr. Rosen opened the letter at breakfast and tossed it across to him, saying he didn't know who the fellow was from Adam. But it wasn't a fellow, said Jane Hellier. It was signed Georgina. It's difficult to say which it is, said Dr. Lloyd. It might be Georgie, but it certainly looks more like Georgina. Only it strikes me that the writing is a man's. You know, that's interesting, said Colonel Bantry, his tossing it across the table like that and pretending he knew nothing about it. Wanted to watch some of his face. Whose face? The girl's or the man's? Or even the cook's, suggested Mrs. Bantry. She might have been in the room bringing in the breakfast, but... What I don't see is, it's most peculiar. She frowned over the letter. Miss Marple drew closer to her. Miss Marple's finger went out and touched the sheet of paper. They murmured together. But why did the secretary tear up the other letter? asked Jane Hellyer suddenly. It seems, oh, I don't know, it seems queer. Why should he have letters from Germany? Although, of course, if he's above suspicion, as you say. But Sir Henry didn't say that, said Miss Marple, quickly looking up from her murmured conference with Mrs. Bantry. He said four suspects. So that shows that he includes Mr. Templeton. I'm right, am I not, Sir Henry? Yes, Miss Marple, I've learned one thing through bitter experience. Never say to yourself that anyone is above suspicion. I gave you reasons just now why three of these people might, after all, be guilty. Unlikely as it seemed. I did, I did not at that time apply the same process to Charles Templeton, but I came to it at last through pursuing the rule I have just mentioned, and I was forced to recognize this, that every army and every navy and every police force has a certain number of traitors within its ranks, much as we hate to admit the idea. And I examined dispassionately the case against Charles Templeton. I asked myself very much the same questions as Miss Hellyer has just asked. Why should he alone of all the house not be able to produce the letter he had received? A letter, moreover, with a German stamp on it. Why should he have letters from Germany? The last question was an innocent one, and I actually put it to him. His reply came simply enough. His mother's sister was married to a German. The letter had been from a German girl cousin. So I learned something I did not know before, that Charles Templeton had relations with people in Germany, and that put him definitely on the list of suspects, very much so. He is my own man, a lad I've always liked and trusted, but in common justice and fairness, I must admit that he heads that list. But there it is. I do not know. I do not know. And in all probability, I never shall know. It's not a question of punishing a murderer. It's a question that seems to me a hundred times more important. It is the blighting, perhaps, of an honourable man's whole career because of suspicion, a suspicion that I dare not disregard. Miss Marble coughed and said gently, uh, uh, Then, Sir Henry, if I understand you rightly, it is this young Mr. Templeton only who is so much on your mind. Yes, in a sense. It should, in theory, be the same for all four, but that is not actually the case. Dobbs, for instance, suspicion may attach to him in my mind, but it will not actually affect his career. Nobody in the village has ever had any idea that old Dr. Rosen's death was anything but an accident. Gertrude is slightly more affected. Must make, for instance, a difference in Fräulein Rosen's attitude towards her, but that possibly is not of great importance to her. As for Greta Rosen, 
Well, here we come to the crux of the matter. Greta is a very pretty girl, and Charles Templeton is a good-looking young man, and for five months they were thrown together with no outer distractions. The inevitable happened. They fell in love with each other, even if they did not come to the point of admitting the fact in words. And then the catastrophe happens. It is three months ago now, and a day or two after I returned, that Greta Rosen came to see me. She had sold the cottage and was returning to Germany, having finally settled up her uncle's affairs. She came to me personally, although she knew I had retired, because it was really about a personal matter she wanted to see me. She beat about the bush a little, but at last it all came out. What did I think? That letter with the German stamp. She had worried about it and worried about it, the one Charles had torn up. Was it all right? Surely it must be all right. Of course she believed his story, but, oh, if she only knew, if she knew for certain. You see, the same feeling, the wish to trust, but the horrible lurking suspicion thrust resolutely to the back of her mind, but persisting nevertheless. I spoke to her with absolute frankness and asked her to do the same. I asked her whether she'd been on the point of caring for Charles and he for her. I think so, she said. Oh, yes, I know it was so. We were so happy. Every day passed so contentedly. We, we knew, we both knew. There was no hurry. There was all the time in the world. Some day he would tell me that he loved me, and I should tell him that I, too. Ah, but you can guess. And now it is all changed. Black cloud has come between us. We are constrained. When we meet, we do not know what to say. It's perhaps the same with him as with me. We are each saying to ourselves, if I were sure. That is why, Sir Henry, I beg of you to say to me, you may be sure whoever killed your uncle, it was not Charles Templeton. Say it to me. Oh, say it to me, I beg, I beg. And damn it all, cried Sir Henry, bringing down his fist with a bang on the table, I couldn't say it to her. They'll drift farther and farther apart, those two, with suspicion like a ghost between them. A ghost that can't be laid. He leant back in his chair. His face looked tired and grey. He shook his head once or twice despondently. Ah, there's nothing more that can be done unless... He sat up straight again and a tiny whimsical smile crossed his face. Unless Miss Marple can help us. Can't you, Miss Marple? I've a feeling that letter might be in your line, you know, the one about the church social. Doesn't it remind you of something or someone that makes everything perfectly plain? Can't you do something to help two helpless young people who want to be happy? Behind the whimsicality there was something earnest in his appeal. He had come to think very highly of the mental powers of this frail old-fashioned maiden lady. He looked across at her with something very like hope in his eyes. Miss Marple coughed and smoothed her lace. Well, it, uh, <clears throat> it does remind me a little of Annie Pulteney, she admitted. Of course, the letter is perfectly plain, both to Mrs. Bantry and myself. I don't mean the church social letter, but the other one. You living so much in London and not being a gardener, Sir Henry, would not have been likely to notice. Eh, said Sir Henry, notice what? Mrs. Bantry reached out a hand and selected a catalogue. She opened it and read aloud with gusto, Dr. Helmer's spur. Pure lilac, a wonderful fine flower, carried on exceptionally long and stiff stem. Splendid for cutting and garden decoration, a novelty of striking beauty. Edgar Jackson, beautifully shaped chrysanthemum-like flower of a distinct brick-red color. Amos Perry, brilliant red, highly decorative. Sing Tao, brilliant orange-red, showy garden plant, and lasting cut flower. Honesty, with a capital H, you remember, murmured Miss Marple. Honesty, rose and white shades, enormous, perfect-shaped flower. Mrs. Bantry flung down the catalogue and said with immense explosive force, Dahlias. And their initial letters spell death, explained Miss Marple. But the letter came to Dr. Rosen himself, objected Sir Henry. That was the clever part of it, said Miss Marple, that and the warning in it. 
What would he do getting a letter from someone he didn't know, full of names he didn't know? Why, of course, toss it over to his secretary. Then after all, oh no, said Miss Marple, not the secretary. Why, that's what makes it so perfectly clear that it wasn't him. He'd never have let that letter be found if so. And equally, he'd never have destroyed a letter to himself with a German stamp on it. Really, his innocence is, if you'll allow me to use the word, just shining. Then who? Well, it seems almost certain, as certain as anything can be in this world. There was another person at the breakfast table, and she would, quite naturally, under the circumstances, put out her hand for the letter and read it. And that would be that. You remember that she got a gardening catalogue by the same post? Greta Rosen, said to Henry slowly. Then her visit to me. Gentlemen never see through these things, said Miss Marple, and I'm afraid they often think we old women are, well, cats to see the things the way we do, but, but there it is. One does know a great deal about one's sex, unfortunately. I've no doubt there was a barrier between them. The young man felt a sudden, inexplicable repulsion. He suspected purely through instinct, and couldn't hide the suspicion. And I really think that the girl's visit to you was just pure spite. She was safe enough, really, but she just went out of her way to fix your suspicions definitely on poor Mr. Templeton. You weren't nearly so sure about him until after her visit. I'm sure it was nothing that she said, began Sir Henry. Gentlemen, said Miss Marple calmly, never see through these things. And that girl, he stopped. She commits a cold-blooded murder and gets off scot-free. Oh, no, Sir Henry, said Miss Marple, not scot-free. Neither you nor I believe that. Remember what you said not long ago. No, Greta Rosen will not escape punishment. To begin with, she must be in with a very queer set of people. Blackmates, terrorists. Associates who will do her no good and will probably bring her to a miserable end. As you say, one mustn't waste thoughts on the guilty. It's the innocent who matter. Mr. Templeton, who I dare say will marry the German cousin, his tearing up her letter looks, well, it looks suspicious, using the word in quite a different sense from the one we've been using all the evening. As little as though he were afraid of the other girl noticing or asking to see it. Yes? I think there must have been some little romance there. And then there's Dobbs. Though, as you say, I dare say it won't much matter to him. His elevenses are probably all he thinks about. And then there's that poor old Gertrude, the one who reminded me of Annie Pulteney. Poor Annie Pulteney. Fifty years' faithful service, and suspected of making away with Miss Lamb's will, though nothing could be proved. Almost broke the poor creature's faithful heart. And then after she was dead, it came to light in the secret drawer of the tea caddy where old Miss Lamb had put it herself for safety. But it was too late then for poor Annie. That's what worries me so about that poor old German woman. When one is old, one becomes embittered very easily. I felt much more sorry for her than for Mr. Templeton, who is young and good-looking and evidently a favourite with the ladies. You will write to her, won't you, Sir Henry, and just tell her that her innocence is established beyond doubt. Her dear old master dead, and she no doubt brooding and feeling herself suspected of... Oh, dear, it won't bear thinking about. I will write, Miss Marple, said Sir Henry. He looked at her curiously. You know, I shall never quite understand you... Your outlook is always a different one from what I expect. My outlook, I'm afraid, is a very petty one, said Miss Marple humbly. I hardly ever go out of St. Mary Mead. And yet you have solved what may be called an international mystery, said Sir Henry, for you have sold it. I'm convinced of that. Miss Marple blushed, then bridled a little. I was, I think, well educated with the standard of my day, my sister and I had a German governess, a Fräulein, very sentimental creature. She taught us the language of flowers, her forgotten study nowadays, but most charming. Now, a yellow tulip, for instance, means hopeless love, while a china aster means I die of jealousy at your feet. <laughs>
That letter was signed Georgina, which I seem to remember is Dahlia in German. And of course that made the whole thing perfectly clear. Wish I could remember the meaning of Dahlia, but alas, that eludes me. My, my memory is not what it was. At any rate, it didn't mean death. Oh, no, indeed. Horrible, is it not? Very sad things in the world. Oh, there are, said Mrs. Banshee with a sigh. It's lucky one has flowers and one's friends. She puts us last, you observe, said Dr. Lloyd. A man used to send me purple orchids every night to the theatre, said Jane Hellier dreamily. I await your favours. That's what that means, said Miss Marple brightly. Sir Henry gave a peculiar sort of cough and turned his head away. Miss Marple gave a sudden exclamation. I've remembered. Dahlia means treachery and misrepresentation. Wonderful, said Sir Henry. Absolutely wonderful. And he sighed. End of Disc 3